In addition to sheer sentiment, one should not overlook also the abhorrence with which the federal troops, especially their northern component, were held in Biafra. It was in the north that the Igbo people had suffered the greatest violation. The gory pictures of pathetic fugitives, some cradling the heads of their beloved in their laps, had become the iconic summation of everything that was connected with the federal side, but especially with the northern part of Nigeria. The common name for federal troops was Vandals. And this word was propagated on Biafran radio, television, and in the popular press. To imagine that the poet did not share this sentiment would be clearly unrealistic. To Chris, Nsuka, home of the university, represented culture and civilization. Home to that university, the institution that he had helped to build, but now, in his mind, menaced by barbarian hordes. It's tempting, therefore, <clears throat> to see Chris, as he saw himself at that time, in addition, of course, to his identif identification with the side, the Biafran side, his own people, the Igbo, to see himself really as defending culture against barbarism. And of course, when the troops arrived in Nusuka, they lent affirmation to that notion, that conception of themselves, when they uh, entered the university and destroyed a part of the library. What matters is that Christopher, I'm convinced, saw himself as the protagonist of culture and learning. However, the immediate danger over, Chris chose to remain within the army and as a combatant. We know that in times of imminent danger, uh, let's say a town is on the very uh, verge of being overrun, ordinary citizens like you and me, all professions will pick up uh, weapons uh, at hand, pickaxes, uh, shovels, sticks, etc., and rush to the city's defense. Such people are defending their homes, the stemming, the breach, until the uh, professional uh, reinforcements arrive. When the danger is over, they return to their homes, their schoolrooms, their factories, their farms, and also even among professional soldiers, officers may obtain their commission through occupational routes medical, education, propaganda, signals, intelligence, etc. Christopher, however, chose to remain a combatant. Now that puzzled me. Chris was not temperamentally suited to violence. I was close enough to know him, so why? After the immediate danger was over, why did the poet, who until then had never wielded a weapon, why did he choose to remain? Why had poetry ceased to matter? Or perhaps more accurately, for Kibo, why was it suddenly relegated? Why did it lose its preeminence as the call? When and how did poetry dissipate to be replaced by another and fatal mistress? Well, first of all, experience uh, dictates that poetry never completely deserts the poetic imagination. New images may augment or cross out the old. New experiences supplant as new resources enter one's life. New phases of world regarding uh, rebuke previous uh, complacencies, assumptions, erode previous certainties, but the poetic mind soldiers on continues to operate as wont on whatever new realities it encounters, propagating new clusters of expression, images, eliminating the mundane as always. And so there is also a possibility that we cannot rule out that Christopher 
never really ceased in his mind to be a poet, that he now recognized himself, if only partially, as a war poet, felt that maybe his calling was to be a war poet. Anyone who knew that Chris at all would also know that he had his romantic side. He would not be the first, nor the last, alas, in that line of poets of action in the tradition of Wilfred Owen, Siegfried Sassoon, etc., or indeed Homer, poets who felt called upon either to glorify or else to vilify, testify to war in form of that memorable expression, the pity and the terror of war. Whether they are voluntarily uh, soldiers or else have been conscripted, as some of our war poets have been. But Christopher, we know, volunteered. And this is what holds our interest. Chris's case was quite complicated. And it's important here to call attention to his own immediate past. That immediate past that produced, led eventually to the Civil War. A past in which Christopher was no mere onlooker and more than a, a propulsive agent. He was an active participant. Several factors join uh, forces to impress this upon me, both what I knew at the time and what I eventually deduced when the first military coup of January 1966 took place. But first, a critical, albeit purely fortuitous, digression. It's a long digression, but a necessary one, being both pertinent and cautionary. So I must narrate here what I was doing only a few weeks ago, um, almost the entire week of August 6, to be precise. BBC World Service had embarked on a series of programs in preparation of the uh, notation of the 40th anniversary of the Civil War. And I was invited to, retrieve, to retrace my journey from Lagos to Enugu, capital of the secessionist state, um, in that uh, doomed attempt to mute, even at that late stage, the drums of war it's all narrated in uh, The Man Died, as well as in my recent memoirs, You Must Set Forth at Dawn. My contribution to this BBC effort would come under a regular program uh, called My Journey. Narratives of people uh, who had undertaken memorable uh, journeys uh, for one reason or the other. A journey of discovery, affirmation, nostalgia, romance, unusual vacations, quixotic or hair-brained, etc., etc. You can decide to which category my own uh, <laughs> journey belongs. What you would never guess, however, is how pertinent even the staged repeat of that journey turned out to be. Talk of history repeating itself, and usually at my expense. The idea was that I would begin in Lagos, retrace that route, exchange recollections wherever possible with some of the principal or indirect dramatis personae of that war, those who were directly or indirectly involved in my own intervention. Remarkably, but perhaps not too surprising, not too surprisingly, the two major pro protagonists readily agreed to be interviewed. I had over a two-hour recorded interview with General Yakubu Gawan, you know, my host in Kirikiri Prison, <laughs> the head of state on the federal side, and one nearly as long with uh, Odumegu Ojuku, then head of state of the secessionist state. Among other players in that tragic drama, I had an evening with a Colonel Achuzia, uh, a scientist turned uh, maverick uh, soldier, and um, war technician as well, who played such a prominent role in the war. He became a household word, a household name, at par with the other gentleman on the federal side. You remember him, the black scorpion, Brigadier uh, Adekunle. Unfortunately, we couldn't interview Adekunle. He was ill and had gone abroad for um, uh, treatment. Uh, maybe it is just as well. Adekunle is a searing 
repudiation of the war and regret of his role in the victory of the federal side is all public knowledge. In fact, he's the bitter passion of his denunciations will probably have blown the gaskets of the BBC recording equipment.